I apologize, none of the technology is working, but hopefully at least my slides will work. Um, so uh, like Luke and Jeremy, my goal is to tell you a little bit about some of the things that are going on in my lab, some of the questions that we're most excited about, um, and also to sort of get you a little bit out of your comfort zone in thinking about perhaps a different kind of data, a different kind of level of analysis that you might usually operate at. Um, so in my lab, we work on rats and the kind of thoughts that rats have. Um, and I think even though the emphasis in this summer course is on naturalistic stimuli, um, you know, the brain is not just there to respond to stimuli. Like the brain is always generating its own activity. It's generating thoughts all the time. So let's try to think about what naturalistic thoughts look like. What is the structure of internally generated activity in the brain? And I think the rodent hippocampus in particular has served as a kind of model system for trying to appreciate what are the kind of patterns that are spontaneously generated um, by brain structure. Can we access the contents and the structure of those, those kind of patterns? And so if you haven't seen this sort of thing before, um, understanding what the hippocampus is doing in rodents means often starting with place cells. And so these are neurons that are active at one particular location in an environment. So what you see here is an outline of a T maze. Um, and you'll see the central stem here. The animal can go left or can go right. And all these black dots are the location of the animal when one neuron fired the spike. So you see those spikes are clustered at this particular location here, which we refer to as the place field of one particular place cell. Um, and we can summarize the activity of this cell um, by constructing a tuning curve. This is just a plot of location uh, against firing rate. So you'll see for most locations, this neuron isn't very active. And then at some specific location along this trajectory, you get this big bump in higher firing rate. So with this, we can now ask, what does it look like to have the activity of not just one, but of many such place cells recorded simultaneously? And so we can order those according to where on that track um, that cell is active. And I'm playing for you uh, the data where each neuron is assigned a key on a piano keyboard as the animal is going to run along that trajectory. So as he starts out, you'll see you get these cells here kind of in the beginning that are mostly active. And you hear the pitch is getting higher and higher. There's a little pause here. And then you see neurons that are higher up. You see the pitch is getting higher and higher, right? And then by the time you get to the end of the track, you have these neurons that are all the way at the end, um, get these sort of high tones happening. So most of this should be unsurprising. I just told you, well, you have cells that prefer different areas of this track. And clearly, if you're going to move smoothly along it, you'll just activate you know, one neuron, the next neuron, the next neuron. Nothing really unexpected there. But if you look carefully at this sort of activity, it sort of becomes obvious that there's more structure than just that gradual progression from one cell to the next, right? And you, in fact, see this kind of repeating pattern that you can almost draw like these diagonals through there. That's sort of like the way a pigeon walks, right? It's an analogy that I borrowed from Bruce McNaughton, where even though the animal is moving smoothly through space, for some reason, the hippocampus is kind of packaging that experience into these repeating trajectories that move forward, that reset, that move forward to reset. Um, that's really weird. Why, why would the brain structure do that? Like, this is not something that's in the stimulus, right? There's nothing that is kind of repeating and resetting that we're presenting to the animal. He's certainly not running in this kind of back and forward kind of way. So there's something about circuits, neurons, their interaction, the hippocampus, how it relates to other brain structures that makes this pattern. And it's interesting to speculate or do experiments that try to probe what, what the function of such a thing might be. Um, Similarly, you can think about what a memory sounds like, right? So what happens when the animal isn't actually moving around, but he's just chilling in his home cage. Um, you're still recording from the same neurons. Um, you can make the same sort of a sonification of that activity. And you might encounter something like this, where you'll hear and see a pattern that has some similarity to what happened when the animal was running on the track, right? But this was happening when the animal wasn't moving at all. Um, it's just sort of stationary. And there's, again, no obvious stimulus that's being presented here. But the hippocampus emits an activity pattern that, um, again, is very related to previous experience. So this is the famous kind of replay phenomenon, right? That uh, initially it was thought that this was just kind of a literal repeat of some previous experience. Again, affording kind of an access point into 
perhaps memory, if you believe what this is, or perhaps you believe this is actually about planning, or about some other interesting cognitive process that relies on internally generated activity. Well, in this sort of experimental preparation, we can access it at the level of spikes of neurons and really get at the fine time still structure, structure of this internally generated stuff. Um, so just to visualize in a different way what I just showed you, so when animals move around in spaces, um, you know, in their hippocampus, you'll see this nice spatial temporal sequence of place cells, one being active after the other, and makes sort of this broad time scale diagonal at the level of behavior. But then if you zoom into that, you see this repeating structure that about eight times per second or so, it makes this sort of trajectory forward before resetting. So those are referred to as theta sequences. Um, and then you have yet another um, kind of phenomenon that is this replay, right, when the animal isn't moving at all, and you have these sequences that occur spontaneously in the absence of, of any movement. So at least two of those time scales are, or those phenomena are generated internally, and there's some speculation, some ideas about what those things might do. So these theta sequences, um, you know, they're continuously repeating, they're happening when the animal's running. One idea is that that kind of reshapes neural activity in a format that makes it easy to run spike timing dependent plasticity or LTP, like the sort of stuff that you need to, at the molecular level, cause long lasting changes in synapses or in neurons. That perhaps those molecular processes work better um, if activity patterns are arranged in a certain way. A lot of that is still kind of speculation. Um, one idea about the sharp wave ripple associated sequences or replay, so the term sharp wave ripple just refers to an oscillation in the local fuel potential, which is recorded simultaneously with the neurons, um, is that you know, they have some different properties, but maybe they're important for a kind of memory consolidation that once you've laid out like an initial activity trace that's maybe facilitated by these theta sequences, then when the hippocampus serves as a kind of short-term memory buffer, you can tell the rest of the brain about it by kind of broadcasting these synchronous events. So there's sort of an overarching kind of framework or theory where these different activity patterns in the hippocampus fit in some larger story in information processing and learning uh, memory recall. Um, and we're interested in all these pieces of this theory. But for now, I want to tell you about one question piece of data that zooms in on these sharp wave ripples or replays. So the traditional story, like I mentioned, is that this is really about consolidation, right? That you have this division of labor where the hippocampus is specialized in encoding something that happens once. Um, then you have you know, this fast learning structure that can lay down a short-term memory trace. And then over time, maybe when you're asleep or when you're resting, it can tell the rest of the brain about it so you can have a longer-term memory or you can extract some statistical regularities from that experience. Um, so more specific versions of that kind of idea is that maybe when you think about reinforcement learning contexts where you're learning about where are rewards available in the environment, um, you can use replay to kind of update what different parts of the environment have certain kinds of values. That if you've learned that uh, there's good sources of coffee sort of at the back of this building, then the locations that take you there might also have larger value just because they're not immediately associated with coffee, but because you can get to coffee from those places. So kind of making all that self-consistent might be another function of these sharp wave ripples. Um, another idea is maybe it's just episodic memory, that whenever you get a replay event like that, that it's a retrieval of a specific episode of something you did earlier on that might be useful for deciding um, what you want to do now. Um, and a related idea is that maybe it's about sort of simulating possible futures, that you're not limited to just repeating literal experience, but you might form a plan or a trajectory towards some goal that you haven't literally experienced. So there are all these ideas around in the literature of why you might have your hippocampus generate these kind of internally, uh, you know, these, these specific patterns. Um, and there's a lot of sort of result, resolution on does it do all these things, under what conditions does it do what thing. Um, and the kind of strategies that are taken to approach these kind of questions of what they're for is basically, you know, you can measure the content of those kind of sequences and ask, well, uh, what are some biases in what is likely to be replayed? How does that depend on various experimental conditions? Or you can try and go in and disrupt them, like prevent those kind of activity patterns from occurring and say, well, would you then get uh, impairments in certain kinds of behaviors? 
Um, so we're trying to pursue, along with many other labs in the field, sort of both these strategies. Um, so how do you access the content of sharp wave ripples um, or replays? Well, you basically do a kind of decoding, right, where you have some raster plot like I showed you earlier. And for every time window, you can construct a vector of spike counts that just says, OK, for this window here, the first neuron fired three spikes, the second neuron zero spikes, the third neuron two spikes. And we can put that through a sequence of decoding steps where we ask, what is the probability of the animal being at different positions in the environment, given that this is the data that we saw? And we can do that for one cell. We can combine that information across lots of cells and end up with a kind of final estimate that's a decoded posterior, right? It's a probability distribution of how likely was the animal to be at these different locations given this data. And it might look something like this. And then you could say, well, if the animal actually was at this location, um, we can quantify how well our decoder was doing, right? So it's a way that we can um, sort of make principled decisions about what is a good decoder, what time bin should we use, and so forth. So when the animal's actually moving around, we can kind of get a ground truth and say, okay, we do great at decoding the animal's true location. Now, for decoding something that is internally generated, it's a little bit strange, right? Because we can't really compare that output to the animal's actual location. It's sort of compared to uh, something we learned from the data when the animal was moving. Um, and there you know, are interesting questions that could and should be asked of you know, how, do, how do you know whether that's the correct answer that you know, I'd love to talk about if, if you're interested in that sort of thing. But for now, we're not going to worry about it and say, well, we're just going to apply the same decoder that worked like over here, and we're going to apply it to this internally generated activity and see what sort of things we can find when we do that. And so one experiment that um, we've, we've ran somewhat recently, although the data analysis is taking quite some time, is we wanted to ask um, what happens when you change the motivational state of the animal? When the animal is hungry versus thirsty, there's a clear difference in what the animal is interested in behaviorally. Like if we have a maze where you have food here and you have water here, and you change the animal's motivational state. Well, if they're food restricted, they're going to be interested in going towards the food. If they're water restricted, they're going to be interested in going towards the water. And if you believe that replay is about memory of recent experience, or if you believe that replay is about planning a trajectory towards a goal, in this situation, you would predict that the animals that are hungry make replays towards the food, either because they've been there recently or they're about to go there. And you know, conversely, for the water, right, a thirsty animal will do replays towards the water. Um, data analysis pipelines are complicated. Again, uh, I'd love to talk about this. Like There are many steps here that um, have interesting features to them that we don't quite know what the best way of doing it is. So we apply many different kind of analyses and ask if they converge to the same answer. But what you find with these kind of analysis algorithms is first of all, you detect um, nice sequences, right? So these are all examples of the sort of thing I was showing you previously. Like here's a replay that's clear on the right arm, but not on the left arm. Here's one that's clearly on the left arm, but not the right arm. Um, so we can now ask what happens to the content of these replays when this motivational state is changing. So that's sort of summarized in this plot, where in black you have the animal's choices. So here is a water restriction day. The animal doesn't really choose the food a lot, whereas on a food restriction day they go to the food much more often. Um, and strikingly, you see that the content of these replays seems to be the opposite from what the animal is doing behaviorally. Right? And then on a day where they prefer the water, um, you know, they certainly don't have a water bias. Then here's a day where they prefer the food, um, but the replay is avoiding the food. So there's this sort of anti-correlated nature to it um, that surprised us. Um, there's a lot of different analysis here where we can break it out by different epochs of the task. Like, is this already true before they go on the maze? The answer is yes. Is this predicted by some weird property of the place fields? Like, is it somehow the case that if there are fewer neurons that are active on one arm versus the other, it would impair our ability to detect these kind of replays from occurring? So we have to formulate sort of a good null hypothesis, right? Like, how much would we expect to be decoding the left versus the right arm, depending on whatever the setup was that day in terms of how many cells are active where. Um, so we run all these simulations of what we would expect. None of it explains it. Um, again, I'm going to skip over a different way of doing the analysis and sort of give you the summary that in this task and uh, a related task, which also is a T-maze, um, we get this 
weird opposite bias that isn't consistent with a memory or planning account of replay. So we think something is missed by sort of the prevailing theories of what these internally generated patterns are for. Um, that certainly they cannot account for all cases where we ask what is the content of these sequences doing. Um, so you know, there's open questions that um, I'd love to figure out. Like, why is this happening? Are TMAs somehow a weird special case because there's only two alternatives? Is there something funny about switching between two motivational states? Um, is it actually the case that if you did a sharp wave ripple disruption experiment that the animals would be impaired on this kind of task and right? it would be important to test? But I think one sort of interesting way of thinking about what these replays may be doing, and this relates to an idea of prediction that was brought up earlier, that maybe one important job that the hippocampus has to do is to figure out what are good models of my environment, right? How, ca how can I learn to predict what's going to happen next the best I can? And what unique contributions can something like the hippocampus make to that kind of model? And if you think about it that way, then there's a lot of interesting jobs that need to be accomplished as part of learning and refining those models, that you might have multiple alternative models that you're considering, and you might want to test, well, how good are those models in accounting for some data that I saw recently? Then the idea of running you know, replays of previous experience could be a way to arbitrate between different models. Maybe some of those models could be, you know, I'm the kind of animal that likes to go left in this environment. Um, how would how, how useful would that decision be given my model of where the reward is going to be? That you might want to replay those things that you didn't do so that you can compare what the expected reward would be from those different policies, if you want to think of it that way. Is there a question? Yeah. So these are all dorsal CA1. Yeah, these are the classic like place cell regions. And yeah, there's questions about would this look the same in other subregions? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so also as part of this generative model kind of view, like it's important to think about like when is a model too complicated and when is a model too simple, right? You, know, you might want to discard details of a model that aren't actually useful in generalizing to new situations. So again, if you're trying to compare between different models or updating in the light of new experience, like is this still an accurate description, you might make some pretty different predictions about the content of replay than if you're just thinking about it as like its only job is to repeat like recent memory or its only job is to plan you know, towards a goal. Now obviously this is still a very vague idea, but I think at some level like the brain has to solve this kind of problem and internally generated activity might be a good way to contribute to this kind of model selection uh, issues. So you know, we have lots of sort of questions about um, the content of replay. Just to point to a few possible hackathon projects, if you use the sort of visualization that Jeremy introduced earlier, so this is now a thought space where you see two trajectories that are basically this uh, raster plot, but now uh, vectorized into spike counts, just like we do for the decoding, and then that's put in here. And these two trajectories just correspond to two runs of a left trial on our teammates. Now you could ask, well, if you also had the trajectory for a right trial, which I didn't show you here, but it's a slightly different one. Like it's also consistent, but it goes in a somewhat different direction. Like it starts at the same point and then kind of diverges. So you have left and right trials for each animal that you can imagine doing a transformation between those left and right trials that are a sort of geometry of left versus right. So even though an individual animal might have different place cells that represent one arm or the other, is it true that across animals that relationship between left and right trials is always the same? And if that's true, does that relate to your ability to um, compare uh, left and right choices? Like if you learn that left is bad, how much does that then encourage you to take the right choice? Like are those related in some systematic way or do you treat them kind of as totally independent learning environments where whatever you learn on the left has no bearing on what you do on the right side. Um, similarly, you could ask if you take different trials that are different uh, in time, as they inevitably will be, like you do one and then sometime later you do another, would these trajectories kind of shift gradually, right? That you start from at, at one point and then over time they would either drift around randomly or maybe they move around systematically instead of randomly. And if that's true, if you now think of what is the content of a replay rather than the content during actual behavior, would such a replay be specific to an individual time? Or would it be kind of a, an aggregate or semanticized version of that original experience, right? It's still an open question to what extent replays reflect an individual episode rather than some abstracted structure over multiple episodes. 
And again, with these sort of tools of visualizing and quantifying where activity trajectories or thought trajectories live in these sort of spaces, we can, we can address those kind of questions. So I think that would be a really nice example of having some convergence from human cognitive neuroscience tools to these sort of rodent systems neuroscience issues where, yeah, the data is very different, like the animal we're working with is very different, but the questions are related in some sense, right? And some of these approaches can probably connect, you know, that kind of data together. Okay, I don't want to keep you from lunch too long, but I just want to point to sort of one different aspect of the work in our lab, which is about how the hippocampus is not just operating in isolation, but it's embedded in larger networks of interacting structures. And one thing that's really striking when you put electrodes in any of these areas is just how rich the patterns of oscillations are that you see, whether you're talking about a local field potential or something that's EEG or even in the spikes of individual neurons, like everything seems to be super rhythmic and structured. And um, I'm going to skip over some conceptual slides here, but one of the things that um, I think is really interesting is if you look at the local fuel potential, there are a lot of pitfalls that it's maybe unclear where the local fuel potentials are generated. And some of the work that um, Eric, my grad student, has done is showing that what looks like an oscillation in a given place where your electrode is might actually be generated someplace else, right? So you can be really wrong if you think, oh, just because I put my electrode here and I record a nice oscillation, that means that area is oscillating. That's not necessarily true. You get this volume conduction from many different places. Um, so there are pitfalls, but there are also opportunities in that once you start looking at what individual neurons and ensembles of neurons are doing, they have really striking relationships to those local fuel potential oscillations that you get phase locking to particular parts of an oscillation. You get different ensemble states, like groups of neurons that are active together during particular events in the local fuel potential. Um, and I think all these patterns sort of invite questions like when you have a neuron that is phase locked to one rhythm or a neuron that's phase locked to another rhythm, or here's a neuron phase locked to a really slow rhythm, um, what is different about the information processing of those neurons? Do they code for different aspects of the task? Um, is it that their oscillatory properties kind of hook them in to different networks that may be signaling or processing different kind of information? Can we manipulate sort of the oscillatory membership of a neuron that if you're trying to learn about that places are important in a task, can we make neurons in hippocampus related areas be more likely to receive place messages from the hippocampus by synchronizing them with those inputs? So in terms of credit assignment, right, which is a fundamental problem that the brain has to solve, like how do you assign bl blame or credit for things that turn out to be good or bad, depending on whether different neurons are synchronized with different sources of information, they might be more or less likely to participate in these credit assignment uh, processes. So in my lab, you know, we currently have sort of these two different areas of looking the detailed information processing in the hippocampus and trying to put that in the context of these larger limbic networks. So decoding replays, but then putting them in a context of oscillations and how sort of these information uh, steps are coordinated across different areas. So if you're interested in that, um, come talk to me, um, talk about some hackathon projects, and yeah, I'm uh, happy to chat about all these ideas. Thanks. Yeah, so I still think that's, that's an important part of what the hippocampus is doing, just because that's supported by so much of the data, like from humans and from rodents, where you, know, you can do these precise manipulations of what happens when you prevent those replays from occurring. And you see deficits in sort of learning of information, whether it's presented once or presented multiple times. So I don't want to argue that that sort of perspective is wrong. I think what I would like to point out is that it's probably not a complete description of all the functions that the hippocampus has. And 
Specifically, it's also not a good description of the content of replay, right? Because that account sort of would predict that you, the content of these replays is sort of retrospective. Like it's saying, okay, what, what is the stuff that happened recently? Let's just repeat that so that I can simulate, you know, being told something 30, 30 times. The hippocampus is telling the rest of your brain about it 30 times. When actually you see in the content of replay, you know, constructive things, you see things that are not, or that are explicitly avoiding recent experience, right? So I would say it's, it's, an, it's a part of it, but it's an incomplete account. And under some circumstances, you, you see very little of what you would expect from consolidation in that sort of simplistic sense. But I think one problem with consolidation is a very vague term, right? If, if you think of consolidation as it means, okay, you just need to literally replay stuff so that the rest of the brain can learn about it, that's different from saying, well, consolidation means model comparison and all that entails, right? If it means pruning of overcomplicated models, if it means uh, explicitly comparing which model is the best in predicting the next time step, arguably that's consolidation. It's just a, a richer and more precise formulation of it. And then maybe it makes sense that you would see other kinds of content in replay. Yeah, so, so I guess one way, um, if, if we had multiple alternatives, not just two, it may be a way of dissociating, like, yeah, is, is it that uh, you're, you're replaying the thing you want to avoid? Like, maybe that's a reasonable strategy if there are only two alternatives, right? Um, and so, yeah, I think you could propose multiple reasons why you might see this sort of pattern. And yeah, I, I agree that that is one of them. And yeah, we could dissociate them by running an experiment with like more alternatives, for instance. Yeah, so we can look sort of across multiple, you know, every, every day the animals go on the track once and we see what their behavioral preferences are and we decode their replays. So across days, it seems like that, that opposite bias becomes gradually weaker. Like it's still there on the last day that we recorded. Um, and we don't, we don't really know what that's about. Like is it that, I don't know, some different brain system takes over their behavior or something? We need to test that with like, yeah, in intervention experiments. Yeah, so, so I guess you might say, well, if you think this is kind of a decision process where you're explicitly considering two alternatives, right? Maybe what you would expect is that when you do a replay of one arm, that should always be followed by a replay of the opposite arm so that you can maximize sort of making a comparison. So one of the sort of hackathon projects from last year was to say, well, on this data set, what is that temporal autocorrelation in replay content? Like, is it that you always alternate, like left, right, left, right? Or is it that you kind of batch them, where you'd go like, okay, left, 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 right, 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 right. Um, and again, this is super preliminary, but it seems like what, what was happening was that the replays are sticky in that when you do a left one, then the next one is also likely to be a left one. And exactly what that means, I think, would need to be understood in context of, yeah, some sort of model of when you're trying to learn what kind of information, is it better to batch them versus to alternate them? And yeah, that seems an interesting direction. But yeah, yeah. just preliminary observations. So for the outing, should we set a meet point like in the lobby of